to the public. Uh, we do need a blue card filled out. You can find these cards out in the lobby, and then you can uh, return that to uh, Board Secretary Mrs. Hahn over here, and uh, we'll get you included. We'll get going here in just a minute. It is 6.32 p.m. on Wednesday, February 10th, and we'll call this meeting to order. Lisa, would you please call the roll? Ben Owens. Present. Anna Marie Knorr. Present. Jim Jordan. Present. Corey Anderson. Present. Great. Thank you. We are on to item 1C, Pledge of Allegiance. And Principal McNamee, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, Principal McNamee. We are on to item 1D, adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second, Lisa. Tori Anderson. Aye. Jim Jordan. Aye. Anna Marie Noor. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. By your vote of 4-0, motion carries. We are on to item two, call to the public. Apologize on my computer doesn't want to
All right. Uh, members of the board may not discuss items that are, that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38-431.08, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for a future agenda. The board requests that all comments be limited to three minutes or less, and the public refrain from speech or language that is offensive or inappropriate, pursuant to board policy KFA. Please state your name and address for the record. And we have five in-person calls to the public. And first is Ms. Patty Couture. Hi, guys. Good evening, President Owen and Governing Board members. In case you've forgotten, my name is Patty Coutre. I am deeply saddened and angered that our community, including some of our teachers and staff, have posted and implied on social media that members of our school board do not care about our students and staff because they do not share the same viewpoint. I am here to acknowledge and recognize that you do care about our students, staff, families, and community. You choose to serve this community, taking time away from your families, making decisions in a pandemic to provide a quality education to all students, whether they be virtual or in person, and to create a safe environment to do so. There is no perfect or right way of doing this, as this has never been done before. There is no manual on how to run a school district during a pandemic, especially with a divided community. I truly respect your decisions, even if they were not what I would have chosen. As a parent, I have watched my son struggle with virtual learning and the back and forth from school to online. After the call last week to go back to virtual, I gave my son the choice to leave MHS. And he told me that as much as he hates the back and forth and being online, he appreciates the days that he is in person and doesn't want to leave Maricopa High. I do strongly encourage you to find a way to keep our students of the families who choose in-person learning to remain in the schools. And I believe that restructuring our quarantining protocols to be less aggressive and inclusive of entire classes will help accomplish this. I love this community and this pandemic has taken so much away and divided us into taking sides. Isn't it time that we stop attacking each other and instead start supporting one another. We need to be respectful of others' opinions and stop trying to force people to conform to our own views and beliefs. Instead of being right or wrong, be empathetic and understand that folks are just trying to advocate for the children and families and agree to disagree. COVID has amplified the neg negativity. It's divided our community, state, and country, and it is still here. It is time to heal to bridge the divide and be that positive, caring community that we witnessed last week when so many came together in some way to support the Nelson family who tragically lost their 17-year-old son, Tony, a life ending way too soon. Wouldn't this be a better community if we started building each other up instead of knocking them down? Change starts with us here in this room. It is time for us to rally and take charge and stop COVID from being the negative narrator of our lives and of this community. Lastly, I would like to thank you, Mrs. Anderson, and I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Ms. Knorr. Thank you, Mr. Owens, for your service and for caring about our students, staff, families, and community. Thank you. Uh, next is Tina Dugan. Hello, my name is Tina Dugan. I live on Arvada Court in Maricopa, Arizona. I'm actually, my children have aged out. But I'm here on behalf of a friend who could not make the meeting. And her concern, her 17-year-old son, was able to go to the counselor at the high school and change from 
being in-person learning when they can, to online learning without her permission. And someone finally emailed her back on Monday and said, if you'd like to discuss, let us know. She replied, I would like to discuss. No one has contacted her. Her child does not do well in online learning. He's already struggling with the little bit of in-person that he gets, but no one from the high school has cared enough to call her back. And she's frustrated and doesn't know what to do or where to turn because she was never even contacted before the change was made. So I just wanted that to bring that to someone's attention. So hopefully someone can maybe look at the communication issues here and not allowing children to change their schedules without parental concern. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, next is Lori Wilson. My name is Lori Wilson. I live on Bear Cruz Drive in Maricopa. I want to thank you board members for all that you've been doing and having to listen to a lot of people. I just have, I want to say a couple things about my son's teachers. Coach Vericker has taken a lot in stride for baseball and we are excited for March 1st to get here. Mr. Jump, Mr. Miller and Coach K have been amazing. They have bounced back and forth. Coach K has found an incredible way to get them to do biology and take their sense of it. He's like, here's your points, here's what you do, and that my child's 127 out of 100 right now. So it's challenged him, but it's also taken that those kids are learning. They are the ones in charge of their grades, and it's not the teacher handing it to them or buttering them along. Coach K is soccer, biology, he's awesome. Um, Mr. Miller takes the time to contact me if he's worried about my son, worried about his social emotional. So the high school teachers are doing great. Uh, Mr. Jump, thank you for the mullet now in my house. <laughs> Ask him about that geometry. My concern with him going back and forth though is that he has told me in the classrooms, the teachers sit far away and the kids sit away from them. If the teacher needs a drink, they go to the corner. They, these are high school students. They don't go near their teacher. They don't want to be near their teacher because they smell. Um, but my kid said the last week he gets a call, oh, you have to be home. Well, guess what? The ISS who was in the room took their mask off because they were six feet away, many times. So now my child has to self-quarantine for 14 days, but he was never near that person. So is there a way to make it that, teacher, you're staying in your box, kids don't go near that box, and we have a way for these high school students to stay on campus. If you choose to be on campus, these kids want to be on campus. Go to Copper Sky on a Friday night. Go to Copper Sky tonight. They are all over there. They're playing sports. They're running around. They're wearing their masks. They're being kids. Secondly, you stated in the last meeting, Mr. Harmon, that we've lost $70,000 in revenue by not having kids in their classrooms. If we continued, we'd be up to $350,000 by the end of March. My concern is what happened in the fall and where do you find that money? I've been through budget meetings. I know we run balance. So you tell me where you're gonna find this money, and now you're saying, oh, but next year we're gonna give raises. Oh, you wanna go to the people and ask for an override. But by not having kids in seats, you're willing to risk state funds, federal funds. But you wanna say, oh, let's give them raises. I'm not saying don't give raises, but don't come at me as a taxpayer and say, I need your override money, I need these things, but I'm willing to risk $70,000 of guaranteed money because I won't find a way to keep kids in the classroom. Thank you. All right, next is Amy Berry. Hi, I'm Amy Berry. I live on Ross Road in Maricopa. Um, I've been a resident of Maricopa for nearly 14 years. I am a big supporter of local public education. I don't want to take my kids out of Maricopa, but I'm really close to doing that. Um, there, initially, I thought that you guys were handling this really well. I was super impressed with the technology, really impressed that there was an online option for the people that wanted it, and an in-person option for the people that wanted it. My children do not learn well online, any of them. I 
They need the socialization. They need the face-to-face -face learning. They need to see and touch what they're doing, not on a tiny screen, not with eight other kids, not with dogs barking and little siblings in the background. It's a poor, poor experience. If a family needs to choose that for their own reasons, I don't, I don't discount that. They certainly can. But our children that want to be, those of us that want our children in school, they need to be in school. I obviously selected the in-person option. Totally turned out to be fake news. My kids have been home more. My older two have been home more than they've been on campus. My youngest, who's still in elementary, she's been home, she's been in school a little bit more. Still home way too much. She hates it. She cries. My teenage boys hate it. Their mental health is significantly struggling. Like to the point where I'm looking for counselors because they cannot be in school. Speaking of being in school and my high schooler, he's actually home right now on quarantine and uh, due to exposure. And I'm, I'm so upset by this. When he, this happened two days after he was back on campus last week and his exposure was due to an aide that popped into the classroom. My son sits at the back of the classroom. They were never within six feet of each other. They probably weren't even within 15 feet of each other. They were both wearing masks. And your policy means that he has to now quarantine. You also, the school also reported it to the Arizona Department of Health, who called me today for an interview. And I shared with them the exact situation. And she said that there is absolutely no reason why he should be quarantined. That you guys are not following the guidance properly. And that she was going to escalate it to her supervisor because he should not be at home right now. He was not exposed. And I, I was able to call, the, I actually emailed all of you, I'm sure you remember my name from multiple emails this week. Thank you to those of you who replied. Shame on you to those who didn't. If I didn't respond to my customers for days at a time, I probably wouldn't have a job for very long. And it looks like I'm running out of time, but I wanna wrap up by thanking um, all of the teachers and the administrators at the schools. They have done an incredible job taking care of our kids, keeping them reassured, doing what they can with the constant changes that are thrown at them because of decisions made by this board. It's not fair to them, and you guys need to change it tonight. Thank you. All right, next we have Amanda Aguilar. Hello. My name is Amanda Aguilar. I have three boys in the UMSU schools. I have two at Pima Butte and I have one high schooler. My high schooler is autistic and my middle child is ADHD. My high school hasn't been back to school at all since last year when it shut down at spring break. He doesn't want to go back because he was tired of the bouncing around. So I haven't sent him back and he's struggling. He is sad and he's struggling. Our teachers have a choice to teach in school and, or stay at home and teach online. Um, the teachers are, that are in school right now, it's because they want to be in school. They want to be there. Um, so I'm not too sure why we keep closing our schools down. Us as parents, we have choices. We can keep our kids at home and learn online or we can send them in school. Still don't understand why our schools are closing. Um, we also have teachers that are vaccinated now. We need to keep our teachers in the school. And still our schools are closing and they're vaccinated. So that's a little confusing also. The quarantine restrictions need to follow the CDC guidelines. Right now they're telling us schools should be open. They're also telling us 10 days quarantine. Um, you guys are doing 14. They're also saying seven days if you can come with a negative test. You guys aren't even offering that at all. Um, we need to stop sending the entire class home. Uh, my kids have been sent home so many times from Alex that's across the room is somewhat close to my son and now he has to stay at home. I, we have to stop that. Um, if, they, if they test positive for COVID, then we send them home. Just like we would treat any other normal sicknesses. We send them home, we disinfect, we move on, we contact parents. Us as parents, obviously we know that we're sending our kids and we're sending them there for a reason. We obviously know that 
They could possibly get it, and we understand that. That's why we have options. <laughs> people that don't understand that stay at home. People that do understand that go out and live life. We need to live our lives and stop dwelling on this. Um, I am a huge advocate for public schools. I've lived here in Maricopa for 15 years. I've always had, I've always been here in Maricopa. Um, but I just, we just need to stop closing the schools. <laughs> it just, I, it's baffling to me. Here's another, just a, a awakening real quickly. My son's birthday is tomorrow and I can't even bring him store-bought cupcakes because of the quarantine restrictions. This is just, we need to stop this. Our kids can't even have fun at school anymore. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you to everyone that uh, came to the meeting this evening to speak. Um, additionally, we did have uh, three calls to the publics that uh, were emailed in. Uh, one was related to 6A, uh, item 6A on the agenda. And two um, were related to 6A um, and 8C uh, requesting that schools uh, stay in business. And uh, we, we all have copies uh, of these uh, emails as well. All right, we are on to item three, superintendent's report. Dr. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Owens. I only have one item tonight. It is with great sadness that I share the passing of one of our Maricopa High School students, Tony Nelson. Tony was a junior at Maricopa High School and was an outstanding ambassador of the inclusive culture that MHS stands for. He was an athlete, a drama student, and a mentor for incoming freshmen. His broad interests and involvement brought so much joy and fulfillment to everyone he knew. Our hearts are broken and the entire district mourns his passing. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor Tony and the presence he will always have in the lives of his family and friends and our entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lopen. We are on to uh, governing board member reports. Ms. Noor, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, President Owens. Um, I don't have anything for tonight. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Ms. Noor. Mrs. Anderson, good to see you again this evening. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just, you know, it's, I, I apologize for missing the last meeting. Um, for those of you who don't know, myself and my husband and my son all had COVID. Uh, my husband had to be hospitalized, and my son and I suffered at home. This is a deadly virus, and being a community member for 50-plus years, um, I will do whatever it takes to protect another person from getting this virus. Um, it's extremely debilitating. So I'm, I'm grateful for those that prayed and sent meals and um, helped our family with drop-off and groceries. Um, so thank you. Um, it, it 
got us through, especially the board members. Thank you for your thoughts and prayers. It was, um, we used it up, I'm sure. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody, but uh, knowing how serious this virus is, if you haven't had it, um, consider yourself blessed because it is absolutely terrifying. And I will do, like I said, anything to keep another community member from getting this virus. So I just wanted to share that, but thank you for your support. Thank you, Mrs. Anderson. Mr. Jordan. Uh, yesterday, a uh, family came by with a child in a uh, push buggy. And uh, so I talked to them. I found out that the child is free and uh, doesn't talk. And I said, wow. Uh, maybe there are some, she's going to be five pretty soon. Maybe there are some uh, services that we can offer to um, to her. So I gave them a referral to, to our school. And uh, uh, Ms. Anderson, I'm glad you're back. Thank you. you. Uh, we, were, we were concerned for you for, and your husband. I appreciate that. And uh, glad that he's going to be OK and you and your son um, prayers being answered. So, thank you. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Uh, the uh, the only thing that I have tonight is uh, related to uh, Dr. Lopin's uh, superintendent's report. I was able to um, on Saturday evening, uh, Copper Sky uh, join. Uh, quite a host of students and uh, community members uh, to remember uh, Tony Nelson. Um, he was uh, he was part of the uh, part of the swim team, and being being that uh, uh, our family and and our oldest daughter is part of that uh, as well. Um, I got to uh, got to meet him and. Uh, I'll never forget his smile and uh, his hair. Certainly, something um, you know to be to be proud of, um, and uh, and just a, um, a delightful uh, young man to uh, to be around. So, um, and then uh, the uh, I guess the other thing that I wanted to mention here too is. I want to thank all of our NUSD staff um, and, uh, and our families, uh, students. Um, the, you know, this year has been very difficult. No one, I think, will deny that. Um, and, uh, you know, well, I can only speak for myself, um, but. I'm doing the best that I can um, in this position. So, um, uh, so thank you um, for uh, for feedback and for sharing experiences. Uh, it helps me kind of understand what you know what the community is seeing. Um, you know, because it could be a different experience than what I have. Um, so. We are on to item. 5A Spotlight School. Dr. Lopin. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Tonight's school spotlight is presented to us by Principal Dina McNamee from Maricopa High School. Ms. McNamee will highlight programs and celebrations that capture the MHS high school experience. Thank you. Good evening, President Owens, members of the Governing Board, and Dr. Lopin. Um, we are First of all, thank you for your for honoring Tony. 
and top of the high school. So thank you. Okay. No surprise, I'm a crier. So <laughs> moving on with the agenda. Um, we're here to highlight some of the, um, the programs and celebrations that we've had this year at the high school, as President Owens shared. It's a, been a tough year, so it's important that we acknowledge where we are um, and celebrate our victories along the way. Um, it's, it's important to acknowledge the struggles and address those and plan for those and acknowledge and encourage our kids and our staff to, to keep moving forward because that's what we need to do. Um, so tonight we have um, a wonderful presentation for you that includes some videos from students and staff um, because that's what we're here for is those kids. And so getting the input from them and the input from our staff on their experiences, we think that's powerful to share with you this evening. Um, you're gonna hear from the staff regarding the Achieve, which was brought up in previous meetings. So we wanted to provide an update on that as well. Um, some planning that involved Freshman Academy and, and boosting that experience for our students to set them up for success. Some celebrations we've implemented to celebrate the progress our students and staff are making with their approach to these challenges and focusing on learning, um, as well as highlighting some great extracurricular things that have occurred on campus and then sharing some, some additional feedback with you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Marlene Armstrong to discuss Achieve. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. So at a former pre, uh, board meeting, we talked about Achieve and we wanted to give you some stats because we have some now and we're super excited to share them. So that at the end of the semester, we had 1,574 classes that were failed, that were just four classes that didn't include the electives. So if you think about that, divide that by however many periods we have, that's approximately about how many students failed. Some students failed one course, some students failed every single course. Um, so during block one of our Achieve, we've taken the last semester and broken it into four Achieve blocks. During block one, we had 264 students who were assigned to a reteach achieve to make up that credit for their core class. 44% of those students earned their credit back, which is amazing. We were hoping for 30%. So if you think about that, that's 115 students who will not have to retake that core class next year. During block two, we anticipate that, well, we have 301 students enrolled in the reteach achieve. And based on that percentage passing, we anticipate that 138 students will recover their credit. And we anticipate that that same trend will continue. Um, when you think about the master schedule, you think about the loss of education for the students, we've given them the opportunity to retrieve and make up that credit. And in the long run, we're doing what's best for kids. Um, so I'm super excited with our statistics for the reteach, which has been my focus of the Achieve model. And our Enrich model is doing great things. You're going to hear some things from students and from the staff as well about that. So thank you. So Ms. Dickinson is getting ready a slide, uh, a video from Ms. Angela Blick. She's a math teacher, and she was teaching the reteach portion of the Achieve model this, this semester. Hi, my name is Angela, and I'm excited that here at MHS we have the reteach and achieve period offered to our students. One thing that I noticed as a math teacher is sometimes our kids need a little extra support and help through the material that we're learning, and after school doesn't always work for kids. But having a time built in within our schedule to allow those kids that opportunity to relearn and to have that intervention is very needed. We also um, received a quote from one of our long-term substitutes, Mr. Corey Nelson. Um, and in, within his quote, he stated with the enrichment piece that his students are slowly building confidence to speak up and share their own thoughts and opinions with him and their classmates. And that's something that we really had a challenge with at the high school, um, is getting kids engaged in their learning. They're just silent participants on the other side of the screen. And so both in person, that's translated to in person as well. And so the Achieve period has allowed um, those connections and those relationship building um, at a greater level to encourage kids to step out of their comfort zone and participate and become involved and communicate. And so that's been, that's been great. 
The next video that we're gonna share with you is from um, a student named Matthew. He's 12th grade, he's a distance learner, and he, was gonna, he wanted to share his experience. In this. Achieve period that we have, it helps re-energize us to continue our day with more enthusiasm than we did in our last period. Um, it really helps us engage and build connections with our classmates. And like Leia said, it gives us a chance to acknowledge and even discuss real world issues that we have. Some of it can, won't even have to be issues. It can be anything about everyday life that we may need to help. So that's what this achieve period gives us. We have one more video from a 12th grade student. She's an in-person student. We're just sharing her experience with enrichment. Go ahead. So, as you know, this semester was implemented a new period called Achieve. Now, as a high school senior, it's very important to me that I have all my ducks in a row and that I'm prepared for my future. So I use my Achieve period to make sure I'm up to date on my current schoolwork, make sure my college applications look good, and apply for scholarships. There are some days where I use my Achieve period just to de-stress from all of that. But the most important thing about Achieve is that it is what you make of it. Have a great day, Ram. We're also coordinating our senior civics exams for students who have yet to pass that as well as their CPR certification during that time. We're coordinating some ACT prep for our juniors who need to take that um, with some test taking tips and strategies to help prepare them for that as well. So there's a lot, a lot of these suggestions for that portion of the achieve period are coming from students and suggestions from families as well. So this is developing and evolving. Um, and we even have some staff that want to use that time to also provide some targeted current interventions for current learning for students. So it's evolving from just supporting current learning with assignments to actually doing some targeted, timely reteach for students with their current assignments as those teachers are available. So it's really evolving into a great program. Um, something else that we've looked at and are planning for, which is a real highlight of my week, is a meeting weekly with a team, the volunteer staff, to discuss and, discuss and plan the Freshman Academy. And that is to really, the goal of that is to provide support for freshmen and really set them up for success um, with the high school experience moving forward. And it's really been a teacher-driven experience. I've, my role has been facilitator, just to help organize their thoughts. And just recently, um, they've come up with a wonderful vision and mission to guide the decision making that they're going to have moving forward. And it's just been really exciting to work with this group. They're very excited about the opportunities and the options available to really focus on student learning and provide that targeted freshman support by creating those cohorts that focus on the relationships with kids to support them through. So it's a really exciting time for us at the high school as we move forward with planning and rolling out this, this academy model for our freshmen. So we have um, struggled with missing our kids and our staff while we're all in the office. We've implemented some celebrations um, this year for our students and our staff. So we have um, a celebration where our teachers can nominate kids every week and those kids are posted in our announcements and they go out in our newsletter at the end of the week also. So these are the things that we're looking for for teachers to nominate those students. Next, Christy. We're up to about five slides now. Um, it started out pretty small at the bottom there, and now our teachers are kind of going crazy with it. It's been pretty awesome. The kids love to look for their names, just like little kids. Um, our kids like to be recognized also. Another thing that we implemented was the principal mug. So if you go to the next slide, um, 
Dina purchased a mug and we have our administration team nominate a different teacher every month who has exhibited some leadership, innovation, creativity, and we take that mug to them, um, whether they're at home or on campus, and they get to keep it for the month and then it goes to the next person. As a result of that, our teachers have asked um, for a mug of their own to share with each other. So we're now creating a visionary mug where our staff will get to nominate who gets that to pass around all the time. Another thing that we did at the end of the year, well, the end of the semester, we had a rose ceremony during one of our staff meetings, which was virtual. So our teachers were able to thank each other and share their gratitude and their um, just celebrating each other for what they're doing in the classrooms and for our kids also. And just to clarify, the mug goes weekly, not every month. <clears throat> so that is a rotating mug every week. And so we're contributing to our local dentists <laughs> and filling that with candy um, that they're very excited about. And it's an emotional thing. We've taken it to people in their homes or in their classroom and they get emotional about it. So it's important to recognize the hard work of not only our staff, but our students and really encourage those behaviors and those things that we value. So it's been a great success. All right, and just to highlight, Miss Wynn is um, at a soccer game tonight. She wanted to be here, but she is taking that on. Um, community connections with extracurriculars. This is sports and um, athletics. Um, it's been a, a focus of our academics or our athletic program, extracurricular program. Um, it's important to highlight the whole program and not just individuals. And so that's something that we've been focusing on this year as well as um, creating an enjoyable and safe experience with the restrictions um, for viewing and COVID quarantines and spectators and travel. Um, it's been a challenge and that is also changing. And so we've been, she's been staying on top of that. Um, and so the big push is also that connection so that everyone has an opportunity, whether they're an in-person student or a virtual student, to be involved and connected in those extracurricular things that they enjoy and they love that um, makes them part of the community and feel like they're part of the community. Next slide. There's a list of mitigation strategies. So those are evolving as AIA um, updates theirs. So we have proactive measures, practice and game measures, and then we have additional measures as well um, that support safe practice for our student athletes so that they can continue um, to participate in those activities. And then we just wanted to highlight mm -hmm. some of our students who have done some great things. Mr. Chavez, Zion Morgan, and Madison Tyler have all signed letters of intent to play at a higher level. And of course, Nolan Ford placed second at the AIA State Swim Meet, and that was a huge accomplishment for that team and for him as well. And finally, we just wanna highlight some things students are saying. It's important that we are continually getting the pulse of our students and our families. And so we have some, some quotes here for, from some students, um, just highlighting the communication and how they increased that. We've increased that and they feel connected and part of um, what's going on at MHS. Um, student of the week, students are looking forward to that and appreciate the recognition and that positive reinforcement. And just some feedback for Achieve, um, where those 40 minutes really allow students to get things done um, and focus on that with that teacher support. Last, almost last, we look at all of our kids. And so we have one last video here we just wanted to share with you. Um, this is also a highlight of my week, and I wanted to share this with you as well. Hi, I'm Matthew Sabetta, and I'm a senior at Maricopa High School. There are so many things I love about my school. I love visiting with the groundskeepers, especially Mr. Chad. He's very special to me. Mr. Winter, Miss Heidi, and so many teachers and staff have been so important to me. And I've saved the best for last. Wait for it. It's my Pyra, Miss <laughs> Kelly Estrada. She makes my whole my whole heart happy and gives me happy tears. Go Rams, class of 2021. We have the honor of visiting with Matthew every Friday. 
Yeah. And um, Miss Lee really has been integral in, in, in keeping Matthew engaged. And so that's just an example of how we're trying to incorporate and encourage all of our students. And we'll even have special guests for Matthew. So if anyone wants to pop in and visit with Matthew, um, contact Miss Lee and she would be happy to help arrange that. He loves special guests mm -hmm. to visit with him. And lastly, the last slide we have for you is from Mr. Ivan Poor, our band director. And I just wanted to share this, this statement with you is we have really, despite the obstacles, we have been very fortunate to have the opportunities that we have had um, in all aspects of our learning um, and extracurriculars, clubs. Um, we had our first blood drive this year. It was social distance, kids were outside, it was a little cold, um, but that was able to happen. Attendance wasn't as it has been in the past, but we were able to make it safe and social distance and appropriate. Um, for the time. And so we're grateful to try to provide as much normalcy in their day as possible. And again, as he states there at the end, thank you so much for supporting us. That's all we have. Questions or comments, board? I don't, I don't have any questions. I just wanna thank you um, and your staff for all the work you've done. And I appreciate the update on Achieve and I appreciate that um, you know, it's continuing to evolve, as you mentioned, and um, just the stats alone on those reteach um, students and them being able to pass those courses um, makes that program so vital. And, um, and I know and I believe that you and your staff will find a way to make it just as valuable for the students who don't need to make up courses. And so I thank you for that. And, um, and, I, and I love your innovation um along those lines i also wanted to thank you for what you've done in the midst of all of this that you're dealing with day to day uh planning for next year and i know you have um, had staff do some freshman orientation type virtual events and i just want to remind the community that uh, that's taken place and it's available online on the high school's website um, because obviously after hearing that um, presentation, why wouldn't you want your kid to go to MHS? So uh, check it out online um, for all the information about how to, uh, the opportunities for freshmen next year. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question, Ms. McNamee. So I know the last time you were here, we talked about the ACHIEVE period. And I did express some concerns about making a requirement for all students to go, because uh, some students just don't need it. Um, some students are already ahead of the game, maybe not as many as in previous years. So I noticed your numbers are about 500 students that are in the chief between block one and block two. Where are the other students? And have you found a way um, for students who don't need the achieve period to use that time for something else? Yeah, those students are do working on enrichment with additional teachers and support. And you heard from some of those students this evening and how they're using that time to refine scholarships, to refine college applications. Um, students are making connections with each other. They're talking about current events. They are catching up on their learning. They're meeting in groups to work on their AP research. Um, they're exploring colleges. Our counselors are available during that ACHIEVE time to support our FAFSA completion, which um, is increasing because of the ACHIEVE time. In fact, I believe we just received an email that we've jumped up to number one um, for our area in that because, because it's supported through the ACHIEVE time that we do have our counselors available providing that targeted support for those groups that need it. So we're continually asking students what they need. Okay. Parents are providing suggestions, which we take, and we are the goal is to make it meaningful for kids in whatever capacity that is. And so... We're con continually listening and we're making adjustments. So it's very student driven and our teachers are making those connections with kids. Okay, thank you. That's, yeah. I'm just happy to hear that, that it's not just a, you gotta stay in this room even if you don't need it, that you've been able to develop some other needs that the students and parents want. So I appreciate that, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I know that I can speak to the Achieve as a parent. Um, my daughter um, is, uh, a student that doesn't need the read. Um, but with the uh, Achieve uh, class that she's in, um, it's kind of opened her eyes with, with that teacher. Um, 
a little bit and she's exploring the possibilities of uh, you know taking classes next year that she wouldn't have uh, otherwise taken because she's in this achievement class period um, so just kind of opening her horizons um, you know a little bit and uh, you know I know a lot of she's just working on getting her schoolwork done and, and that kind of thing so just from a personal perspective um, so I, I appreciate the uh, you know what everything that, that you guys are doing um, and uh, I'm excited to see uh, like Miss Knorr said um, the, the students that, that are uh, coming up and they're not failing that class anymore uh, we'd love it to be 100% but I don't know that that's realistic so um, but you guys are doing great uh, Keep plugging away. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are on to item 5B, Maricopa Virtual Academy presentation. Yes, uh, President Owens, we have Mr. Wade Watson here this evening to um, present to the board and the public uh, the uh, work that's taken place over the past several months regarding Maricopa Virtual Academy and the program for next year. Mr. Watson. President Owen, Governing Board, Dr. Lobman, tonight I have the pleasure of speaking to you about Maricopa Virtual Academy and the progress we've made and looking forward to opening Maricopa Virtual Academy this next year. First off, Maricopa Virtual Academy aligns with our strategic plan in that with goal one, every student graduates prepared to create, innovate, lead, and succeed. And with strategy C, provide multiple paths to graduation to meet the diverse needs of all students. Um, as you know, I've come before you a few times now to talk about Maricopa Virtual Academy. It was in the planning phases um, for almost two years now. Um, just as a reminder, Maricopa Virtual Academy will be a true online school with virtual classes. Uh, it will use a structured research-based curriculum. We receive state approval for our online academy uh, for the secondary program in April of 2020 and for the K-5 piece in December of 2020. Uh, I then brought it before you each time for board approval um, and you did that in April of 2020 for grade six through 12 and July of 2020 for the K through five piece. Uh, it's really important that we look at Maricopa Virtual Academy in comparison to what we're doing this year, which is called distance learning. Distance learning is the model that we have in place to address the pandemic. And it is an online school of sorts though it is not a traditional model like Maricopa Virtual Academy is. So it's important to note some of the differences between the two. With distance learning, we have daily synchronous sessions where teachers are on camera live with students um, for extended periods of time throughout the day. With Maricopa Virtual Academy in a more traditional environment, there will be some synchronous, but it will be significantly less in that it is a more true uh, traditional online school. Um, with distance learning, we had no in-person assessments. With Maricopa Virtual Academy, there will be some in-person assessments for things like final exams and assessments of that nature. Um, with distance learning, we figured out a way for the teacher to take attendance. If you remember when we first started, we had to do some learning logs and so forth. Um, it's important to note with Maricopa Virtual Academy, we do have to have the student um, log attendance, although we have found a way to do that electronically with Maricopa Virtual Academy this next year. So it won't be a handwritten log, but rather the student and the parent logging into an online system to log the attendance as per the requirements for the state. Um, with distance learning, the teacher really sets the pace of the course with Maricopa Virtual Academy at the secondary level, the student um, can set the pace themselves as long as they're keeping up with the academic load that they take on. 
Uh, with distance learning, the student is technically affiliated with their home campus, though they're working from home. With Maricopa Virtual Academy, that student will be officially enrolled with Maricopa Virtual Academy rather than their home school that they would currently be at. Um, with distance learning, we offer all of our courses that we've offered in the past. Uh, with Maricopa Virtual Academy, we will be limited in sorts to the courses that are offered in the online platforms that we have available. Um, with distance learning, we were still able to provide um, extracurricular opportunities for our students, some of those live, some of those virtual. The same will be true for Maricopa Virtual Academy. There will be opportunities to participate in extracurricular opportunities, both live and virtual. Uh, there are some requirements for success for um, students and for parents when we look at online learning that is true online learning and not distance learning of sorts. Obviously, for a student, they need to have access to internet daily. Um, they need the ability to work independently on some level. Uh, they have to be able to communicate with their teachers. And for an elementary student, it's very important that there be a learning coach at home, that there is somebody helping that younger student really access the content, work with technology, and so forth. As for parents, uh, parents really need to be an active part of their student learning and that they should attend an orientation uh, prior to school starting that will give them a really uh, good knowledge of the system and how it works. Uh, they need to work with their students to build a schedule and make sure that the student is keeping up with that schedule throughout the week in terms of how much time they spend on their studies. Uh, they should create a designated work space for the student so they have a place to learn regularly. Uh, the parent, as I said, through the orientation will really get to know the platform well so that they can monitor the student's progress and enter attendance and really know where the student is. Uh, they also should have the ability to communicate with teachers, uh, both electronically or by phone if necessary. And uh, they also have to be able to arrange for those necessary in-person assessments when those arise. Um, again, in an earlier slide, I brought up that there are differences in the amount of time that students will spend synchronously. Um, in grades K through 12, we're looking at approximately 11 to 13 hours per week of synchronous time. In grades three through five, we're looking at approximately nine to 11 hours per week of synchronous time. And then you see how that scales down as we get to the secondary level. And again, the idea is we're looking at a more truly um, traditional online environment where a student is self-paced and their need for a teacher is limited Though I do want to point out that we are keeping a synchronous element. There will still be the ability to see a teacher instruct live um, for those students who need it, which I think is a great piece to our um, online school. Also to note, we will follow the same uh, district calendar and that secondary students in grades six through 12 will take three semester equivalent courses per quarter. That will allow them to focus on fewer subjects at one time um, and still keep pace uh, with their peers by semester. Um, when we look at staffing, it's important to note that class sizes look a little bit larger when you look at an online class. And again, part of the rationale there is that teachers spend less, less time with that live instruction. So if we look at an example like kindergarten, um, we might have 35 students in a kindergarten class, but remember the amount of synchronous time that a teacher provides for those students is less. So they would have the ability, should they choose to split those students into two groups, um, they still have the ability to do small group learning. Um, there are just a variety of ways to address that class size, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they are working with 35 at a time, although there might be occasion to do that. Um, once students are acclimated to it. Um, I think it's also important to note the, the numbers when we move up by grade level all the way up to high school and what those look like. Um, and also note that, you know, for us to offer a full-time position to a teacher, we need to have the student enrollment to justify that teaching position. So 
we look at offering the classes and grade levels that we do based on the enrollment that we have and then hire teachers according to that. Um, it's also important to note that there will be office hours and tutoring hours um, required for the staff so that there is the ability for students to reach out to teachers as well as parents. Um, one final thing when it comes to staffing, especially at the secondary level, when we start to look at elective courses, it's highly improbable that you would have all of your students choose the same elective, thus making it a challenge to hire one um, full-time online elective teacher because there would be a variety of electives that students would choose from. So uh, we look to staff those most likely um, you know, a section at a time for teachers, and that would be by stipending that teacher to teach that single elective course or perhaps a couple of elective courses, depending on what the students choose. Um, so what are our next steps? Um, aside from this presentation, it's important that we really get the information out into the community. We wanna market the program. We wanna make sure that parents are aware of what the difference is between what school looks like this year online versus what school would look like next year in Maricopa Virtual Academy. Um, so in February, we plan to do that. In March, we look at surveying our parents to see what the interest is in their students attending Maricopa Virtual Academy. Um, then we start opening for enrollment. And once we have some enrollment numbers, we can start staffing the school appropriately. And then as we move forward to July and the start of the new school year, we look to begin um, Maricopa Virtual Academy and Maricopa Virtual Academy Junior uh, with the K-5. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. What questions can I answer? Thank you, Mr. Watson. And I, I really appreciate the compare and contrast. I think that's really important for parents to see and understand uh, as we move forward for them to make the best choice for their students. You mentioned that students could participate in extracurricular activities if they were enrolled in Maricopa Virtual Academy. So does that mean that a student enrolled in Maricopa Virtual Academy, a high school student, could play on the soccer team? Absolutely, yes, that is what it means. They okay. would be able to participate in the extracurriculars at the school at which they are um, boundaried for. So the school that you would normally attend within your residence, you would be able to participate in the extracurriculars at that site. Obviously, you need to be in communication with that site to set that up. But yes, you can participate in extracurriculars at the site. Great, thank you. So Mr. Watson, um, I know we, I've met with you already to talk about this, but I just wanted to clarify for um, those out in TV land. So the secondary students would be self-paced, correct? Correct. For the most part? Okay. Uh, a, a secondary student would have the option of self-pacing okay. their learning or following the teacher's okay. pace. Um, but I'm glad you bring this up because if the student were to not for some reason be keeping the pace, you know, it would be time for our uh, Maricopa Virtual Academy teachers to put some interventions in place to make sure that those students are logging on with them and catching up and so forth. But yes, for a student who is successful in the online environment and is independent and can pace themselves accordingly, um, they can do it uh, completely independent of the teacher for the most part with the accession of assessments. Okay, no, that's great. I'm excited because some of our students are pretty independent and others have other stuff they need to do and they don't wanna be in a, a traditional high school. So I'm excited for the option for our students, um, especially for our elementary students. So um, I'm just happy to hear there are gonna be interventions just in case students can't handle the self-paced curriculum. Um, and I'm um, pleased with the fact that we've been able to make this happen. So thank you for the, your two years of research trying to make this get going and I'm excited for the fall when our students can actually um, take part in complete virtual academy. Now the other question I have is, what about those students that just want to uh, pick up an extra class during the summer 
you know, they're already in a brick, the brick and mortar school, but they want to add to their, um, their classes, either for early graduation or whatever their needs may be. Is that possible? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, Maricopa Virtual Academy will have options other than the full-time option. Okay. A lot of what I presented you tonight is, is what a full-time student would see, but there would also be opportunities for summer school through Maricopa Virtual Academy, which this past summer, we actually ran a test with that and offered two courses um, through Maricopa Virtual Academy to kind of get our feet wet with it. We did have approval from both the state and from the board to start that. So we did offer some summer courses this past summer through Maricopa Virtual Academy, and we plan to do that again this year as well. No, that's great. I'm, I'm excited for our students. So thank you for making this happen. Mm -hmm. Mr. Watson, it's great to see you again, first off. <clears throat> um, and uh, I, I just want to reiterate, and I appreciate the, um, the vision that Dr. Lopeman and the teaching and learning in IT had um, back a couple of years ago, right? you know, as you noted, Mrs. Anderson, to really create the MBA that really helped to bring us um, through the past almost year, um, you know, of where we're at. Um, if I recall correctly, um, I think that the board gave initial approval on this back like October of 19, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so that that's before the before everything started. So again, it's that visionary that and, and let's keep that going because that's going to what's going to be keeping us going for the next uh the next years uh you know, just doing that dreaming and and you know, hey, this isn't good enough. We can do better. We can do better. We can add more. So, thank you, Mr. Watson. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Watson. Um, he has seriously been working on this since uh, really 2018, and it took about a year to get to that approval phase in October. Um, and really start the groundwork and multiple um, and in-depth processes with the State Board of Education to get as far as we did, so much so in those initial stages that the approval of the K-5 program sailed right through um, because it was affiliated with the work that they did for the 612. Um, and other districts are actually envious of uh, the model that um, has been created collectively uh, through the teaching and learning department, Mr. Watson, and the there it's been a really um, representative group that's worked on it. So thank you for recognizing that. And thank you again, Mr. Watson. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right, very good. Thank you. We are on to item 6A, discussion of COVID-19 data. Dr. Lopeman. Thank you, Mr. Owens. The, um, a lot of this will look familiar. Um, we're going to continue the conversation about the COVID data and the district response. Um, we have some, um, some updates and some recommendations as well. Um, as we progress, I think it has become obvious to a, a reality for everyone. If we think about where we were, um, you know, nine months ago, we heard, we knew that there were people out there, uh, distant relatives, friends of friends who knew someone who knew someone who had COVID. I think um, it's probably, uh, COVID has probably touched every one of our families in one way or another. Um, the actual illness itself. I know it's, it's um, in my family um, and I know a number of people who have experienced and suffered and endured an entire range of, um, you know, illness. I also know that, um, and we have acknowledged that every single person, I think, in society has suffered some sort of loss, 
whether that loss is the ability to go to school every day, the ability to go to movies, the ability to live life normally, that's loss. Um, and then profoundly on the other side of that range is uh, the loss of a loved one. So um, I acknowledge that this has a tremendous impact for every single person. And I do want to let you know that, um, you know, these decisions are not taken lightly. None of these decisions or recommendations are taken lightly. And the administrators, the school administrators, and our district administrative staff speak at great lengths and agonize over every detail. So uh, I want to lay that groundwork for the, um, the conversation tonight. So we have, uh, we're doing everything we can to advance uh, our operations, starting with um, a vaccination update. The, um, um, the district partnered with Sun Life Family Health Center and um, had a vaccination event on February 1st, at which 180 employees um, received their first vaccine. There might have been a, a couple that got their second one on that date as well. But most of those employees got their first vaccine we, and have the second vaccine already scheduled 28 days later. Mr. Beckett has also coordinated with uh, Pinal County Health to create another opportunity for staff to be vaccinated. And that has begun scheduled for February 18th. You know, 35 employees scheduled at this time. So we continue to do everything that we can as a district to um, put the mechanisms in place to make sure our staff are protected, to remove the obstacles to the vaccination. So we, we return to the uh, benchmark data. Will, this will look familiar. Once again, we know this was updated last Thursday, but the data itself is from, you know, a couple weeks prior to that, towards the end of January, and you can see the downward trajectory. Then um, the Pinal County Health Department has, for, has returned, or has once again begun to provide these district-specific benchmarks. This is two weeks of data because for a while there they weren't able to um, compile it and share it with us, but then they, they found a way to dig it back up. So you can see that um, there, there are minor changes there, um, and it's, it's reflective of the district. Then we've uh, continued to review the Pinal County Epi Curve. This is probably the most recent positive uh, or confirmed case data. Uh, week five is January 31st through February 6th. That was just last week. So. That is self-explanatory. And then we have our school case data. And these are in-person and distance learning students who report the cases. And in-person is blue. Distance learning students are in the gray. And you can see the continued decline in the reported cases. And that's that last, uh, the last data is gathered Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday this week. So I wasn't quite sure how that was going to play out um, when we started tracking the data in January. You know, we just didn't know. We truly did not know. So, and I didn't know what kind of recommendations I would be making tonight, but based on this data, I, I, I mean, the return to in-person learning on the first um, has not come without issues, but it was a return to in-person learning. Um, I work with, you know, the entire, all the superintendents in Pinal County. Not every school district is back in person. I know a lot of school districts up in the valley um, are not in person. Many are, but many are not. 
So um, our adherence to the data and that and using that to to drive decisions has um, has in this case served us well. So um, we a lot of questions arise about the data that we use and how we make decisions. And um, so that's what our next uh, slide is about. These are the protocols that the board adopted last fall to help us de quickly determine when to close a school. And um, it's related to transmission rates, minimal, moderate, or substantial. It's based on the number of cases in a school and the absences. Um, the decision is, you know, if you have three to four cases um, and 10 to 15 percent of staff out on quarantine, we consider a five to seven day shift to distance learning. Um, and that's because it's different than the 14 day quarantine, but that's because of how sometimes one quarantine starts and then it takes a little while to get to three to four cases, and now we maybe we don't need to close for a full 14 days because one quarantine of teachers and staff is going to come back, and so we can shorten the, dis the duration of a closure because of how uh, stretched out the cases and the quarantines may be. So that's the, that explains the difference in the five to five to seven days and the 14 day quarantine. So that's what we do currently. Um, I'm uh, proposing, and it's a, there is very minor change to my um, administrative recommendation and the revision, that's the next slide. And really all we've done is remove the reference to the spread because um, the Arizona Department of Health Services um, really has um, minimized the relevance of, the, of community spread. So um, when, when you originally adopted the protocols in the, in the fall, um, the community spread was clearly defined with recommendations from the Arizona Department of Health Services. How, however, eventually that data had less and less impact on the recommendations, and so the administrative recommendation is to combine moderate and substantial community spread and keep the rest of the um, responses the same, either a five to seven day depending or a 14 day depending. And that's for the entire campus to shift to distance learning. Last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago at the board meeting, the board asked me to consider, um, asked our administration to research and make recommendations uh, regarding the quarantine because uh, the CDC does have alternatives, does provide options. And um, so that's what, that's what we need to discuss. We researched and discussed these alternatives with school and district administration, and I've also heard from parents uh, regarding their feelings and opinions. First, it's important to inform the board and public that the CDC recommends the 14-day quarantine. They've offered options for those who go without pay when required to quarantine. Even though they offer options, the one CDC-endorsed model is the 14-day quarantine. Furthermore, the CDC guidance leads us to take the recommendation of our local health department, and the local health department does stay in tune with community spread. Pinal County Health Department recommends the 14-day quarantine because individuals become ill and test positive with COVID on days 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 after exposure. The shorter alternatives are highly subjective and require in-depth consultation with district personnel about the about very specific circumstances related to the exposure date, symptom emergence and presence, and scheduling of the test and the receipt of the results. 
With each exposure, the range of individuals impacted varies greatly from 15, maybe 15 students on a bus, to over 100 uh, students at the middle or high school. We simply do not have the personnel to dedicate to this critical process when we know that individuals can develop symptoms and illness after the seventh or 10th day. Therefore, uh, the administrative recommendation will continue to be the 14-day quarantine. And I, that's um, a balance between having schools open using the school-specific protocols and um, our ability to manage what the quarantine looks like. When we consider the footprint of a quarantine, we have to consider the fact that we don't have, the fact that we do, we don't do the hybrid model. We do five days of in-person instruction. Uh, we have limited ability to socially distance. And at the middle and high school levels, it's, we don't, we can't cohort students with reliable effectiveness. School districts that have a smaller quarantine footprint, like the six feet situation, um, they, for example, some of them don't have their students go to school the whole day. They don't go to lunch. They go to a half day or a two thirds day. And so they know that they don't have those unstructured times. Our students go to lunch and are there the entire day. They have passing periods, et cetera. So the recommendation from Pinal County, because of how they know how we operate, is to quarantine the whole class. And I know that's difficult for some people unpopular. Um, but until we have the impact of the vaccine, which is 14 days after the second dose, so for the 200 and some teachers or staff members that we're aware of, and Mr. Beckett is doing a survey right now to find out what levels of vaccination we're going to have, you know, after spring break, which will be March 22nd. Um, and we're, we're hopeful that at that point we can modify these procedures and practices. And that's what, that's the, the point of the vaccine, you know, is that protection of the, the teacher um, until we, we are able to use that information to change our operating procedures. My recommendation is to is to do the 14 day quarantine and adopt those changes to the protocols. And I'm avail I can certainly answer any questions or hear your thoughts. Sure. I have some questions <clears throat> about what you just talked about in terms of vaccination of our teachers. So you gave us some great data about the 200 or 180 teachers were able to get vaccinated mm -hmm. at the event. Was, was it only 180 because it was maxed out at 180 or only 180 chose to do it? No, it, um, we, ha we had more vaccines than that. That's how many uh, came to the event. Okay. So I appreciate that the district is providing the opportunity for our staff to get vaccinated. I also appreciate that we are not forcing our staff to get vaccinated because that's a personal choice. But if we held an event and we had more vaccines than people choose to, choosing to get vaccinated, then whatever the date of the next, their second shot is and whatever date after that, that it's fully effective, the quarantine should stop because they have had their opportunity to protect themselves and their families through the vaccine. 
and, and at that point, we protected our teachers because the students that are at school and the parents that send them there are choosing that risk. Mm -hmm. So they maybe get vaccinated, they maybe don't, but that's a choice they're making. I understand the teachers don't all have a choice. And so I am very um, sensitive to the fact that getting them vaccinated and getting them fully vaccinated is a priority. But if we held an event and there was more vaccinations available than people vaccinated, that, that then the people who wanted to get vaccinated got vaccinated. And so whatever it is a month from that and then the two weeks from that, I mean, I, I don't want to say we'll wait and see. It should be a hard and fast. Yeah. There's no more quarantine. A couple uh, things to, oh, I'm sorry. Um, that puts us after spring break. It is what it is. I mean. So, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just helping right. you, you know, laying out the calendar. But I think we need certainty. Well, we're, one of the things that we're waiting for, and this is, a, this is in consultation with Dr. Spears from Pinal County Health, um, is to get that, uh, that guidance, that understanding from in writing from Arizona Department of Health Services and then filtered through Pinal County because they're, they're always uh, in alignment. And that's what we anticipate. We anticipate the, you know, the expectation that once considered vaccinated, uh, we, can, we can change some of our operating protocols. But it, it takes a lot, you know, we have to see what the levels are and see how the impact is. But why do we have to see what the levels are? If they chose, they either chose to get vaccinated or they didn't. Like, right. I, if if forty percent chose to get vaccinated and sixty didn't, that's their choice. We open up. We don't quarantine. I mean, it's not at a certain point. It is not my job to protect someone else from themselves. They get to make that choice. And if they've had the opportunity, then we need to move forward. Right. We have to move forward. I mean, because to me, it seems like it's like just constantly moving the ball. And, oh, we wait till the vaccine comes out. Oh, but we only have this many vaccinated. Well, if you've had the opportunity to get vaccinated, then that's it. You've had it. We also know that there's, we, we do have people that really took advantage of the Copper Sky event that the city um, opened up. We, and we had other, other people who, um, you know, went to State Farm Arena, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I anticipate positive data um, from the survey that, that Mr. Beckett is conducting right now. Um, and I expect it to have an impact on our operating protocols. And that's the point of the vaccine, is, is the ability to step out of, out of the bubble, right, so, um, so to speak. So I'm looking forward to that as well. And from the district perspective, the first event was the first. The second one is March, March 1st, 15 days after that, 14 days after that. We'll be in the middle of spring break. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to positive data that, that on the horizon. So Dr. Lipman, can I interject here a little bit? Um, February 1st, I, I don't want to say staff it's not just teachers it was all staff it was the whole district mm -hmm. was eligible mm -hmm. some people couldn't make it so they may have wanted to get their vaccine but someone like me who was already on the couch dying basically from the virus i could not come in to get the vaccine so there's other reasons why staff was not available that day mm -hmm. so i just wanted to put that out there but also even after you get the second vaccine you're not immediately immune to the virus. You have to wait for it to still build up in your system. That's two, what I said, so it's two weeks. weeks. Yeah. I, I acknowledge I, for that. For some people it's longer. Yeah. But I just think that waiting till spring break is a safe way to go about it and then adjust our protocols. The other thing is it's not so easy to get a test and it's not so easy to do any of that. You know, I tested negative on Monday, and by Sunday I had the virus. So you can contract it any time. And even after you have the virus, you're only immune for 90 days, and then you can get it again, which is terrifying. So as far as us trying to even get tested to see if we're negative, even that's not possible. 
there was a week wait to even get a test, and I checked on all kinds of websites. So it's not so easy to just say, yeah, I'm gonna get a negative COVID test, and then I'm gonna be back in school. Those tests are not always available. You have to make an appointment. So I, I think there's several things we need to take into consideration that this is not easy. Um, and, and I think for me, after having it, I choose to be overly cautious and to stick with the 14-day quarantine until after spring break when more of us are vaccinated. The other thing is I don't know if there's a way, and, and I know that our teachers are overwhelmed, but I do or I would like to see us look at a way, even between now and spring break, that we can only quarantine part of the class, that it's not the whole class. And I know that puts more of a burden on teachers. Um, and it's really hard to contact trace where you've been. Believe me, I've tried it. So there, there's so many issues here um, that I would rather, like I said, be overly cautious, stick with the 14 day for now, and then adjust it after spring break because I think that we'll be able to make those adjustments. And in the meantime, look at a way, at least for our secondary students, if, if, so we don't have to quarantine the whole class, but maybe 10 students in the class or five students in the class. I just, you know, I, I just, I, I, I understand that it's easier to just say the whole class, but maybe we don't always need to take the easy way out. So, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a way that we can do it, but I would like us to look at it um, just to see at least until spring break, if there's a way that we can get away with not quarantining the entire class. Just those five students or 10 students that happen to be around the, the positive teacher or student. Um, absolutely. <laughs> um, I know that was a lot. That's a sh it's not, it's not a lot. Um, And we can look at that. Um, the challenge was the seven and 10 day quarantine. That right. was the complicated staff uh, drain Correct. that I spoke to. Um, but we can, uh, we can look at the discussion we had in the fall was the, the six foot radius mm -hmm. and having an in-depth in -depth conversation with the teacher. That was how we began. Okay. Is, and uh, we can we can uh, revisit those concepts that we began with, and um, follow up. And I have one other um, suggestion. Um, I know that Dr. Spears and um, I keep thinking of his first name, but Dr. Spears did a presentation to the city council, and I'm just wondering if we could request that Pinal County Health Services comes and makes a presentation. To our, at our next board meeting so that people can get the information firsthand um, and then kind of see what the update is at that point. So I, I would just like to see if we could reach out to um, Dr. Spears and uh, you know our county supervisor and see if they'll come and talk to um, at a board meeting, do a presentation. Sure. Okay. I think that'll help a lot, clarify some of the myths and uh, misunderstandings as we all interpret things differently. So. I have a follow-up to Ms. Anderson's um, idea about limiting the scope of the quarantine to just those around the person. Um, and you said we did that initially? That was where our conversation began and then some things got muddled about um, the, the conversations with teachers and, you know, that kind of thing. So we, we, we did a blanket. We did a blanket to uh, to um, minimize that. So um, it, it that was how we started, though. Right. So it, in order to go back to maybe that, but maybe a modified system that you have. You know, we've learned a lot <laughs> over the last since oh, that time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. And and things have changed 
since then. You can do that, Dr. Lohman, right, without the board action, because that's not part of our protocol. It isn't part of the pro no. It's not. It's not something that we've put in writing. It is something. It, it's just been the advice that we've received from Pinal County, um, and it was advice that I. Re it was through a conversation right. here that we we did not place such great emphasis on those conversations. Right. That that emerged from a board meeting. So I get, this is emerging from a board meeting, and it's that simple to restart those in depth conversations with teachers about those, those, those details, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, because I, I know our teachers want to be in the classroom, those that, that can be. Um, so if we can just look at how we can adjust that between now and spring break, it, it might be worth it. But, but I'm not saying we change our 14 day quarantine, just the amount of the people The footprint of the, pro, of the yeah. quarantine, I understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I actually think that changing the footprint of the quarantine is more effective. And well, that'll change a lot. Right, and, and will we'll radically lessen the extent of the quarantines, and it's scientific. Um, you know, the CDC says within six feet. Mm -hmm. So, um, And we take the word of the teacher. Right, right, which we, should, which we can trust because they're our teachers. Right, and that, yes. again, that's where we started. Right. So absolutely, right. I'm happy to return to that. Yeah, yeah. I think, because I, for me personally, um, in the emails I've gotten and the um, community input I've received, we have to move. I mean, we have got to move on this. We, we have to shift in, in some way, shape, or form. And I actually really appreciate um, Member Anderson's suggestion, I think it's a good move for us, because like I said, we're not, um, I don't even feel like we're weakening our system because it, it will still comply with CDC guidelines, but it will significantly decrease the impact it has on the parents and the students and the teachers and the community. Um, because those big, huge quarantines are just, I don't know, it's even mentally, it's just a lot <laughs> for for these kids and, 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 um, and their parents and, I mean, I got a text from my son. He's like, Mom, there's like 90 kids in the gym. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You know, he's like, what's going on? You know, just it's a lot. It seems like worse than it is, I, I feel like, um, when we do these really widespread quarantines. So, um, you know, I appreciate your willingness to, to look at going back to that model, staying within the guidelines, staying within CDC protocol, but, but really helping to lessen the impact on, on our students. At least take a look at it and see if it's doable. Mm -hmm. So understood. I was just wondering if, in these cases where we get a, a, a child or a student or a, a teacher, uh, may, maybe even just a teach a student, if if we couldn't uh, come up with a medical professional who would help us sort that thing out, somebody that would the public would trust? Is that a possibility that we, on a temporary basis, consult with a medical pro professional to come in and investigate the class, and even if it's just interviews? We have a, um, a number of RNs who facilitate, registered nurses who facilitate the conversations. We have a district lead registered nurse who uh, collaborates with Pinal County on the recommendations that we've discussed tonight okay. on, the, on the procedures that we've been following. Um, she sits in on when we have meetings with Pinal County to discuss quarantines and closures. She has often participated in those. She has uh, probably thousands of conversations with parents and teachers and administrators about um, you know, about these details, about the types of symptoms, the duration of the symptoms, et cetera. Um, so we have that. Did, does she help make that kind of a decision? On Absolutely. Class? And okay. I and in fact, whenever there's a question, um, there's a, there's you know, there's always a school administrator. There's always uh, the the district lead nurse, and there's always Michelle Terry, and myself that are having conversations about these closures, regardless of the location. And whenever there's a question, we say, what does, the, what does Elizabeth Stevens recommend? 
and we say, okay, let's follow what she says. Because when it comes down to it, I, I, my decisions regarding someone else's health and the impact of, on someone else's health need to rely on a registered nurse, our local health care, our district health care professional. Right. So. so Dr. Lopeman, Supervisor Jeff McClure. That's, <laughs> I just want to put that out there. My, I had a brain freeze for a moment. But I'll he'll just come text her. with Dr. Spears yeah. and, uh, and do a presentation. And I think that would be extremely helpful to me. Um, and I think, like I say, dispel some of the myths and uh, misconceptions. Please. Absolutely. All right, very good, board. Great discussion. Is that it? On that? That's all I got. All right. Okay. Very good. Moving along to item seven, consent agenda. Motion to approve as written. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa? Tori Anderson. Aye. Jim Jordan. Aye. Anna Marie Noor. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. By your vote of 4 0 board, the motion carries. We are on to item 8A. Good to see you, Mr. Beckett. Good to see you, President Owens. Thank you so much for the opportunity once again to share the personnel schedule with everyone tonight. Uh, I'll take any of your questions at this point in time. I don't have any questions. A motion to approve. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa? Tori Anderson. Aye. Jim Jordan. Aye. Anna Marie Noor. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. By your vote of 4-0, motion carries. 8-B, discussion and possible approval of first reading of to rescind board policy GDCG support staff volunteer transfer of accrued general leave. Mr. Beckett. Thank you. President Owens, members of the board, Dr. Loebman. Uh, we bring this uh, action item to you tonight. Uh, recently on our last uh, two meetings in uh, January, we passed a revised policy that included not only uh, our professional staff, but also our support staff. Uh, so this new, uh, this policy uh, that is presently uh, underneath the support staff is actually redundant, not necessary, is obsolete. And so we're just asking for uh, to rescind this policy. Uh, the support staff and professionals have to be supported by uh, the, the policy that we adopted in January. And I'm asking for your approval and support. Uh, well, in honor of our former board member, Patty Cotre, I wish she would have stayed for this because she just loved cleaning up policy. That was like <laughs> one of her things. So in honor of her motion to approve. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Lisa? Tori Anderson? Aye. Jim Jordan? Aye. Anna Marie Noor? Aye. Ben Owens? Aye. By your vote of 4-0, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beckett. Uh, on to item 8C, discussion and possible approval of revised protocols for response to COVID-19 cases. We just discussed this board. Mm -hmm. Unless there's any other discussion, I motion we approve the changes suggested by Dr. Lopeman um, for our COVID-19 protocols. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa? Troy Anderson? Aye. Jim Jordan? Aye. Anne Marie Noor? Aye. Ben Owens? Aye. By your vote of 4-0, motion is approved. 8B, discussion and possible approval of the proposed salary and longevity increases for staff members for the 21-22 school year. Mm -hmm. Mr. Owens, um, this is a, a celebration. Um, we continue with a 5% raise um, for our staff, certified, classified, and administrative. And um, through uh, the vision of the strategic planning and the continued collaboration from the meet and confer process and other employee group meetings, we're pleased to um, propose the longevity increase as well for employees five years and uh, 
five years to nine years and 10 years and over. And we know that this is a, an acknowledgement of longevity and experience that is sustainable. So um, it is with great pleasure that, that I, um, first of all, thank Mr. Beckett and Mr. Harmon for their work, um, but present this proposal to you on behalf of our staff as well. Well, I think this is needed. Um, it fits in our goals to have higher salaries as we as we can to uh, retain and recruit teachers. And uh, I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. Um, I, I also want to make a comment. I, Ultimately, our goal is to increase our student achievement. And 10 years ago, we recognized that um, one way to do that is to retain high quality staff. And so we made a commitment with HR as a board to do what we needed to do to make MUSD the best place to work, first of all, but secondly, to acknowledge and celebrate those teachers for staying with MUSD, because that is what is going to continue our student achievement going up. So I, you know, I am thoroughly pleased, um, almost giddy, and the fact that we've been able to retain a high quality staff, many for over five years, and many more for over 10 years. And that is something that Maricopa had not seen since I was in school, that our staff was like a revolving door. And so I am um, excited, but I wanna thank staff for sticking with us because I know they're dedicated to our students. Um, so I, I am thoroughly excited to be able to offer the longevity piece on top of the 5% because we do owe our student achievement to our teachers. And so, and to all of our staff, it's not just teachers, but our, our other staff as well. So I, I'm excited and I, I think we need to do it. So, um, and I know that the state does recognize us as having a high quality um, staff that has been here for five years plus. And I think that that is a huge, huge achievement in the goals we set, you know, 10 years ago and five years ago. So um, thank you to this community, but our staff and our teachers and, and all those um, that have been involved in making this goal happen, so. And for the principals too, thank you for <laughs> managing all of our, our uh, staff and teachers. So yeah. if, if there's no other discussion, I, I just want to add yeah. one more thing um, about this. As Member Anderson mentioned, uh, to have student achievement, we have to have highly qualified teachers and they have to stick with us because consistency is also key for these children and students that we're serving. And when, when we're dealing with teachers and certified staff, that certificate that they have as a teacher can go anywhere. They can get a job right now in today's world, they can go get a job anywhere they want. There are openings in every school district, every charter school. I mean, honestly, there's openings everywhere for a teacher with a certificate. And so in order to maintain a high quality staff and retain a high quality staff, we have to be competitive with our salaries. And um, I appreciate that Dr. Lopeman and her cabinet have made this a priority, that not only have you made it priority, but we're getting out ahead of it, that our teachers are gonna have their contracts early so that they know the commitment that we are um, giving them for next year so that they stick with us and so that we can continue to build on the success we've had and create more success. And so I just think it's important for uh, the community to understand that we're competing with everybody, everywhere, um, and and there's openings everywhere. These teachers could do mm -hmm. whatever they want, honestly. Um, that, that's the market right now for teachers. And so um, investing in our teachers and showing them that we 
appreciate what they do and that we want them to have a competitive salary uh, so they can support their families, I think is so important. And then it, that goes along with classified staff too. Um, and really all of our staff, um, again, we, we've tried really hard and Mr. Beckett's done a good job of trying to keep the turnover low um, in some of these positions in the classified staff, the paras, especially, it's hard. And I think that anything we can do like this 5% raise um, will help to keep them with us and, and help to keep the consistency for our students that um, is really what will determine um, our future success. So thank you. And um, that's all I have if Ms. Anderson wants to make her motion. So if there's no other discussion, I wanna make a motion that we approve um, the salary increase and the longevity increases for staff for school year 21-22. I will second that. We have a motion and a second, Lisa. Tori Anderson. Aye. Jim Jordan. Aye. Anna Marie Noor. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. Prayer vote of 4-0, motion approved. On to item eight, the discussion and possible approval of the teacher contracts, related service provider contracts, classified work agreement. Uh, counselor contract and administrator contract language for the 21-22 school year. Mr. Beck. Thank you, President Owens. That was a long uh, agenda item to read, so thank you for doing that. Members of the board, uh, Dr. Lohman, uh, Member Nora, thanks so much for kind of preluding this uh, discussion. Uh, these are our uh, contracts and our notice of appointment for our classified staff for the 21-22 school year. Every year, I send these off to our attorney. He reviews all of the contract language to make sure that we're aligned with state statute. Uh, and again, we have these back now prepared and we're asking for your support uh, with our hope that we would start issuing contracts probably within the next month uh, to all of our employees. All right, thank you, Mr. Beckett. Board discussion or questions? Not from me, thank Comment? you. I don't have any questions. If there's no other questions, any questions, I'll uh, motion to approve. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second, Lisa. Roy Anderson? Aye. Jim Jordan? Aye. Anna Marie Noor? Aye. Ben Owens? Aye. By your motion of 4 0. Or by your vote of 4 0. <laughs> um, and item 8E is approved. And as we move on to uh, the adjournment here, um, I do want to uh, recognize um, we've got a member in our audience, uh, Mr. Robert Downey that will uh, was uh, just approved uh, this week by uh, Jill Broussard, uh, Pinal County uh, super, superintendent, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so he will be filling uh, the fifth position um, on our board. So we're, uh, we're excited to, uh, to have him uh, come on board. Congratulations. And uh, be stay tuned for information on that swearing in. Uh, we are on to item nine, adjournment. So um, moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa? Tori Anderson? Aye. Jim Jordan? Aye. Anna Marie Noor? Aye. Ben Owens? Aye. By your vote of 4-0, this meeting is adjourned. It is 8.22 p.m.